it sounds so hard to, because you seem, you seem like you're just right in the middle of the fire. How am I ever going to get out of this? How am I going to look back and go, I was refined by this, this pain? But you will. You will. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Granger Smith Podcast. This is episode 116. Thank you for listening. Thanks for watching wherever you are. You know, Spotify now has video. You can go and listen to the podcast and actually see the video right there on your Spotify app, which is awesome. You could watch me on YouTube, Apple Podcast app, and anywhere else that you can listen to podcasts. That's where you're going to find this one. Thank you to the longtime listeners. And what's up to the brand new listeners? Maybe you came from TikTok. I've been putting up a lot of these little clips from these videos. Ian, the guy that edits this, what shout out to Ian, he's crushing it. And Ian will make these clips and then I'll put it to music and put it on TikTok or Instagram Reels. So some people come from that. Some people come from that TikTok that I put on Twitter. So however you got here, however you find found out about this podcast, I'm just grateful. I love this platform. I love the I love the long-term form of it. And what we do here on this podcast is I answer your questions. You email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. It could be anything about any subject. It could be about music. It could be about career. It could be about relationships. It could be about grief and loss or, or finances. Really anything, and I've seen anything and everything. Email me, put a good subject line, make it readable, you know, like don't make it 10 pages long, and tell me your name, unless you want to be anonymous, and tell me where you're from so I can get a kind of an idea of who I'm talking to. And I, and I love I love digging into these. I have so much going on in my life, a brand new radio show starting January 1st. You're going to hear me on a show called After Midnight, nationally syndicated show. And so you're going to hear me from midnight to 6 a.m., Probably in most places in the country, you'll be able to find this on FM radio. And then I have uh, The Smiths, our YouTube channel, our family vlog. And then, of course, I have music, touring, um, songwriting, recording, and I'm working on a couple other things that are kind of a secret that I can't say yet, but they're really big. And one of them, one of those reasons is why I'm, I look like I um, forgot my razor and I just f- completely forgot to shave in a long time. That is all coming soon. I'm gonna I'm gonna explain all this soon. I'm by myself, no guests today. Um, it, during the holiday season, it's just more difficult to coordinate on my end having someone come and picking a time because it it really ends up this podcast ends up being something where it's like you know what I got some time I'm gonna run up to my studio and record a podcast and I literally pull up these emails that you guys sent and I just start start going through them without really referencing, without studying. I don't have notes in front of me. I don't have like a list of really cool quotes. I kind of wish I did sometimes. I wish I could be like, boom, just hashtag some just crazy quote that, you know, rocks the world. I don't have that. So it's just, it's all off the top of my head and it's, it's in a form that I like to think of in terms of we're sitting around a campfire and, you know, it's getting late and, and the fire's burning down and I'm sitting in the Adirondack chair and someone walks up and goes, hey man, could I, while we're sitting here, could I run something by you? And we just talk through it, you know, as, as, as if I'm just, we're just old friends talking about something in their life. That's what this is. Because of that, I'm not going to be right all of the time. You're going to have to take all of these answers with a grain of salt as if we're just friends. Sometimes, for instance, I'll see on TikTok, one of these things go up and I'll see some people that really like it, a clip from the podcast, and then there's always people that go, disagree, this is totally wrong. Hey, great, that's your opinion. If you had a podcast uh, and, and you would probably answer it a different way, and I'm totally cool with that. That's just what we do around here, and thank you guys for listening. I want to dive in. The only one that I've seen that I'm going to read today is the first one, because I like to start with something a little bit lighter, so we don't just I don't just dive in and accidentally jump into an email that's super heavy, and that's how we start. So this first one, the subject line is, message on YouTube, really you, question mark. It says, hey, Granger, I got a notification from a comment I made on YouTube 
uh, one of your YouTube videos. It appears to be from you, but it seems unrealistic. Just checking to see if it's spam or not. If it is, I love the Smiths, your concert in Maine, and your podcast, so inspirational. This comes from Sherry in Wales, Maine. Sherry, great, great question, and I love, uh, love that you asked this because it's very important. In fact, many, many, many episodes ago, I did an entire podcast on this subject with a lot of research that I put in. There is so much spam. The short answer to you, Sherry, is no, it was not me. If it was me, there would be a blue check next to my name, right? So it's going to say everything I'm on in social media, everything that says Granger Smith, that's me, has a blue check. You have to look. And, and this is the same with any any influencer or celebrity, anyone with a lot of followers that, that um, has some kind of platform, they're almost all of them are verified. And that's the blue check. So you need to look for the blue check because there's so much spam and, and, and it usually comes from Nigeria and it, they are getting more and more creative. And it's, it's crazy. As I did the research for the, for the podcast that I talked about all this, there, is, there are literally factories in Nigeria where people come into work just like anyone else works and they walk in and they sit in front of a computer that's provided for them in the factory. And their job literally is to create accounts based on American influencers and try to comment or direct message people and what they're doing. They're always after something. So they might start it as, thank you for being a big fan. I love you so much. They're they're trying to open the conversation, but it's always going to end up being something like, I created this account because my man, I didn't want my manager to know about it or my record label or my wife to know about it. So I created this personal account so that I could interact with my fans personally. It's all a lie. And then they're going to get you to eventually get off of that social media account and go to an email or go to a direct message where then they're going to talk about financial problems that they're having. And can you send them a, a, iTunes gift card or an Amazon gift card or or some some kind of digital gift card. It's always that. The the worst part is that a lot of times they're targeting charities and so they'll they'll act like they're a charity and that they're looking around the holiday season to to build up so that they can give to the homeless or some you know some kind of great cause. And it's like all I need is $25 gift card and we're going to give it to this great cause. It's it's all a lie, and and unfortunately, the reason that there's factories in Nigeria is because so many people fall for it, and so many people uh, fall victim to it, and and it's, it's 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 a tough situation because the kids that are doing this in Nigeria, and they're all like twenty twenty one years old, they're not inherently more flawed than you or I. They are doing all they know how to do. They're getting, there's not much, there's not very many jobs. And so they, they get recruited on the street and they come and they, they get an hourly wage. And it's not like it's one person just spamming the world. They work for a boss who has a boss who has a boss. And so they're coming into work and they don't, they don't really see the problem in it because they're so disconnected from it. They just do what they're told to do. So I can't really blame them as much as we blame the system, but but that being said, what we need to learn as listeners and as social media followers is, is how to navigate the dark alleys of social media. And what I mean by that is, is when we, we know as humans, because of, of, of so many years of walking, walking down streets in dark alleys, we know where not to go. Like we know that if you're in New York City in the hood at night, you're, you're not just going to walk by yourself and go through some buildings where the dumpsters are and go down the dark alleys at three o'clock in the morning. You wouldn't do that because you don't know what you're going to find there. But we haven't quite learned that on social media. I believe that we will. I believe we're going to get better and better. And our kids are, are going to be way better than our adults. And our grandmothers are in deep trouble when it comes to this because they have no idea. So we need to protect our aunts and uncles and parents and grandparents as they're on Facebook and they're seeing these because they, they, they're not as trained like some of the younger people are to go, that's fake. 
I know that that's a, that's a parody account. That's false. So we need to inform everyone around us like, hey, remember to look for the blue check mark. That's like walking down a dark alley. If it doesn't have a, a blue check and they're messaging you and it's Luke Bryan, then it, it, it's a fake and it's a dark alley that you shouldn't be walking down. So don't engage, okay? Sherry, that was not me. Great question and I'm glad we brought it up. Next question, subject line says, question for the podcast. Hello, Granger. I'm a huge fan of everything you do. I'm Matthew. I'm 21 years old. And the girl I really, I, there's a girl that I really like, but she recently went through my cell phone while I was sleeping. And I feel like trust has been violated. And I'm lost on what I, to, on what I should do. Should I stay with her or just break it? Well, 21, the, the first question, I, the first thing I would say to you, Matthew, is that having the girl at your place while you're sleeping and you're 21 years old and you're not that serious about her anyway is not going to lead to anything good. So that's, that's a problem to begin with. You're spending too much time with her. Overnight, it's too much time. But yes, there is a problem here. You, you recognize this, Matthew, that, that, that there's, a, there's an, an underlying problem with her going through your phone. Sometimes I could say this, if we're sitting around a campfire, I'd say, she might be cheating on you. Because sometimes people that have this huge fear of their partner cheating on them, it, they're, they're going through the same thing th themselves or they're struggling with the same thing. Maybe, maybe she's talking to somebody. Maybe not, but it's, there's a chance, there's a, a better chance that if she's so worried about you and what's in your phone, that she might be doing the same thing. So there's a red flag. Second thing I would say is, are you giving her reasons to not trust you? And maybe you're thinking no, but from the outside looking in, are you very flirtatious with other girls? Do you have a wondering eye? Like, does she catch you walking down the street and you're kind of, your eyes are following a girl that's walking by? Are you that kind of person? Has this happened before? Has she caught you in something before that you shouldn't have been doing? Uh, all these things lead to, to this distrust that she has. My, my old drummer, Michael, would say, she needs more hobbies. She needs more things to do if she is... She has enough free time other than sleeping in the middle of the night to pull out your phone and start going through it. Some people are probably listening, thinking to themselves, hey, me and my girl, we have a great relationship and we give each other passwords to everything. Like my girl has passwords to my Facebook and I have passwords to hers and we're, we're free to go through it at any, at any time. There's something unhealthy about that too. Like, you, do you give your passwords to, to your girlfriend because of a trust thing? Like, you think that that's going to build trust? There's kind of, there's a problem with that, right? Like, that, 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 like, trust should come before giving passwords. You should just trust someone because you have no reason to not trust them. You've never given them a reason, and the girl has never given you a reason, and to think about giving them your password is like ridiculous at that point. It's like, that's a waste of time. You know what you're going to find. You're going to find nothing. So all that said, Matthew, if you're thinking about, should I stay with her or just break it off? That's your, that's your last question. I'd say break it off. Because if it, regardless of, of what's going on, if something so petty as this coming between you guys is something that you're willing to, to entertain the thought of breaking up with her, hey man, it's not strong. There's not a strong enough bond there. Like they're, the the pieces are are too separated. They're a little bit too broken for this to matter, for this to last longer than her going through your phone. So if you're thinking about it because of that, that's a yeah, yeah, break it off. And and hey, I've been in relationships like this. Amber has too. In fact, she told me today that you know th there there's been times when when she's been in relationships just like this one. And so sometimes it's the, the combination of the two people getting together and they just don't trust each other. 
And, and the thing is, you can get in, an, in another relationship after this, and there's total trust. Like there is, there's nobody going through anybody's phone. And so it's not really the person, it's the combination of the two people that makes this a bad situation. I'd break up with her. Next question says, subject line, how to deal with grief. Dear Granger, this is with a very heavy heart that I'm asking you this question. I received a call early Sunday morning, December 19th, 2021, from my mother that my nephew, Sean, a member of the Navy, second enlistment, had committed suicide by gunshot wound to the head. My family is so broken on this Christmas, and I'm coming to you deeply saddened and wondering how do you cope with this grief so I could be strong for my two children, his cousins, for my family. I'm truly lost right now. Thank you. This is Erica from Jackson, Michigan. Erica also says she's a member of Yee Yee Nation. Erica, I'm so sorry uh, that you're going through this. The holiday season is, is a tough time for grief. It's it's the hardest time, really, because you have you have birthdays of the person you lost and you have the holidays. These are times when you're typically with them or talking to them. And so when they're not there, there's a table. I mean, excuse me, when you're, when you're not with them, there's a chair missing at the table of the, the dinner of the holiday. And, and that just makes it for a tough Thanksgiving or Christmas or ringing in the new year or celebrating a birthday. It makes it really tough. The anniversary of the death is tough too. So these are like speed bumps on, on the, the road to recovery of grief. The first one's always the hardest. The first one. The first one of any of these. The first birthday, the first anniversary of the death, the first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas. It's tough. So the first step in all this, Erica, is that just recognizing that you're feeling grief. And that, that, that sounds silly, but recognizing it and realizing that you're broken and that, that someone is missing is, is a good, healthy first step, as opposed to denying it or avoiding it, sweeping it under the rug. The second thing I would say, Erica, is that whatever emotion you're feeling, whether that's, that's sadness or joy or happiness or contentment or, or weeping grief, whatever you're feeling at the, at the moment is valid and it is right. The reason I say it that way is because you might be thinking, well, of course, I feel sad. But five hours from now, someone could say something funny and, and you'll, you'll instinctively laugh because it's funny. And, and then right when you laugh, there's this thought that just, that just comes in like a thief into your mind. And it says, your brain says, you fool. How could you laugh at a time like this? You're grieving. You're not supposed to smile. You're not supposed to, to enjoy any moment. And that's false. Whatever you're feeling in grief is valid at the time. So don't, don't let that grief, it's a thief, and don't let it steal the joy that you still have because joy cannot be erased. Happiness comes and goes. It's fleeting. You know, happiness is when you walk outside and the sun hits you just perfectly comes out of the clouds and it just hits you and you're it's 70 degrees and it's perfect and you go huh happy i'm happy but but joy it's not fleeting joy joy comes from god and it's it's inherently in us and it's it it boils out of us at any time grief and joy can coexist so i want to i want to warn you of the thief that grief is when it wants to come in and steal uh, that that joy or that happiness or that contentment, whatever emotion it is, it wants to steal it away from you. So, so, so sit content, knowing that whatever happens, whatever moment, whatever you're feeling, is right and it it, it is okay. After that, Erica, I would tell you that this is a step by step process. 
there is no, you know, you, you'll read these, these books about the different stages of grief. And it's technically right, but it's never in the order that the book says that it's in. You could be angry, followed by guilty, followed by remorseful, followed by numb, you're right, right? You could you go through all these emotions, but they, they change orders. And then you could be angry again. You could feel guilt, Erica, in the fact that I should have done this with Sean. I should have said this. I should have reached out to him. And if I would if I only would have done this, if I would have called him or texted that, that I was thinking about this text and I was going to text him and I didn't send it. And because I didn't, he killed himself. You're gonna you're gonna have those thoughts of guilt that's gonna overcome you. Don't let it. Don't let that guilt sneak in. It's a thief also. You asked about your two children, his cousins. This is, this is, it's life. You don't ever want kids to go through this kind of experience. But yours are. Mine have been through it. And because they are going through it, you're going to have to use this as, as a teaching moment for life, that this, this is terrible, and that that your your cousin Sean, uh, you're going to have to explain the best. Depending on their age, their age matters in this conversation, but you're going to have to walk through this with them, and and tell them truthfully, and and show them, Erica, that that it's okay to cry, and, and they might they might reach moments where they're they're giggling and laughing and playing, and you're sad. And then before you know it, you're smiling and cooking spaghetti. And then one of them gets, starts to get sad about Sean. And you have to immediately pivot to them and say, are you sad about your cousin? And then you hold them and you say, it's okay. It's okay to be sad. And so you, you're never, families are rarely on the same grief level at the same time. Like we flip-flop. And so, and that's a good thing. Because if you're all sad at the same time, every day, the same time, it makes it difficult. And so sympathy comes when you have someone that's down and, and, and they're in grief and, they're, and the grief is like a quicksand. And so this is what sympathy is. Sympathy is when someone's in, in quicksand and you step in the quicksand with them and you grab them, you grab their hand and you hold them and you say, I feel your pain. I feel this with you. But you still have a foot, your other foot, on dry land. So you, you grab them, you put one foot in the quicksand, and you take their hand, and you go, I'm going to help you get out of this moment, out of this quicksand, because I got a foot on dry land. And the difference between that and empathy is empathy is when you dive in with them, into the quicksand with them. And so many people are so quick to, to be full of empathy and say, I, I empathize with you. And in my opinion, guys, that's, that's the wrong move, especially in grief, because empathy is when you jump in the quicksand with them and you hold them and you say, I feel this with you, same as sympathy, but you don't have a foot on dry land. And so what happens? You both sink in the quicksand and there's no way out. There's no way out. Make sure you always have a foot on that dry land. Avoid the guilt like a plague, get rid of that guilt. Use it, call it out for what it is. It's a, it's a thief and it's a liar. Say, I will not fall for this guilt. I will not fall for that thought of that last text, that last call, what I should have done. And lastly, once, once you've navigated this, because these, this step-by-step process, you, you have to take it day by day. And then the day turns into weeks and the weeks turn into months and the months turn into years. And the years, when you add them up, will eventually, you'll, you'll feel relief from that immediate grief, right? So 10 years go by and you will not be feeling the same biting pain that you felt on ground zero day one. We could all agree to that. No matter where you are, no matter what grief it is, on year 10, it, it's still going to hurt, but it's not going to feel like day one. So if you're thinking, and, and there's people listening that are they're going through grief right now, 
So I'm speaking to everyone, not just you, Erica. But if you're thinking, I can't, I try to go day by day, but I can't, it's too hard. So then you go hour by hour. And if hour by hour is still too tough, then you go minute by minute. If minute by minute is too tough, you go second by second. If second by second is too tough, you go heartbeat by heartbeat, breath by breath. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. And the same, the same theory with days going by, the breaths, the heartbeats will go by and turn into seconds and turn into minutes and turn into hours and turn into days and weeks and months and then years. The last thing I'll say about this is that once you kind of pass you, you get out of the quicksand where it still hurts because you never, you never move on, okay? You just move forward. You keep moving forward. So you could, you could realize that, the, that although I can't, I will never move on from the hurt of losing Sean. I can move forward. I can move forward. We all can. We're capable of it. Humans are incredible at overcoming. Look at history. People have been through horrific things and they have the capability of moving forward. We are are amazing creatures that God made for that purpose, to keep moving forward. And what I would do when you do find that place is I I would put energy into suicide relief, suicide prevention, specifically with with military men and women. We see this so often with military men and women. And so when you're, when you're dealing with this kind of suicide with, from PTSD, uh, you could, you could help with that spreading awareness, help, help, um, financially, or you could help in counseling places or hospitals or, or, or some kind of, uh, any kind of relief organization for suicide prevention, you could help and you could put effort into that. And through that effort, through that help, you will find joy in that. You will find a, a healing that's unlike any other through pouring out in that way. The level of grief you have equals the love that you had. So the more you love, the more you will grieve when you lose them. And that says something. Because if you didn't have them at all, you wouldn't have the grief, but you wouldn't have them. And that always, having them for a short time is always better than never having them at all. I'm going to take a break. Be right back. Guys, today's podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens AG1, one of my favorite companies to read for. One of the things that I do every single day in my own personal routine is I take three scoops of AG1. Actually, used to be one scoop. I moved it up to two. Now I'm putting three scoops of this stuff in my protein shakes every single morning, seven days a week. I started eating this Athletic Greens supplement when I first started reading for it on this podcast, and I loved it so much, and I felt so good when I started taking it that I went and signed up for myself and got my own subscription, and now I'm on a monthly plan with them. I pay full price, just so you know, no discounts here, and I say that so that you could you could know how, how much I really do enjoy AG1. It comes in the mail, super easy subscription. You could cancel at any time. It just shows up right when I need it, right when I need a refill, and it's a green powder superfood. You could, you could put a scoop of it in a cup of water and drink it that way, mix it up a little bit. It's very fine, so it's not grainy at all. So it, it mixes really well. In fact, it's so fine that, that when, I, when I put it in my shake, it, when it falls in, it, there's like this green smoke because it's so fine that kind of puffs up. And, and I say that because it mixes really well. It just completely immerses in the water and becomes water. I put it in my protein shake because I, I love what it does and the, love the way it makes me feel. And it's, it's supplying me with the greens I need for the day without eating a ton of salad or vegetables. So I could accomplish what I need with my greens in one protein shake. And I, I absolutely love that. So AG1, it's, it's a company that, that has dedicated their entire being and to making a lifestyle friendly, uh, whether that's keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it's all that containing one gram, 
less than one gram of sugar, no artificial GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, and it still tastes good. It supports a better sleep quality and recovery. It supports mental clarity and alertness. It's one of the, the best things that you could do, really, in, in your daily lifestyle. Tons of people take it for some, you know, they, tons of people take some sort of multivitamin. And it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients so that your body can actually absorb it. And it's not some like massive horse pill that your body can't really absorb. But AAG1 is a small micro habit with big benefits. It's one thing you could do every single day to take great care of yourself. Your subscription will come with one year's supply of vitamin D. That's so important to add during these winter months when we don't get as much sunlight. Uh, it was created with the founder who experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him like a hundred bucks a day. He, he then created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine of his own. So this is le a, a legit company, has over 7,000 five-star reviews recommended by professional athletes, trusted by leading health experts such as Tim Ferriss and and all kinds of people, me, I'm one of them. I could, I could raise my hand to that. Right now, it is time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. In just one scoop and a cup of water every day, that's all you need. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your, your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Granger. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Granger to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, digging back into these questions. The next one, subject line says, hi, school. Question is, hey, Granger, I'm a huge fan. My name is Liam. I'm 14 years old. This is my first year in high school, and I'm having a really hard time keeping up my grades this year. This is mostly because I can't motivate myself to do my work. I've tried to get help, but no one seems to understand what I'm having a hard time with. High school is so much harder than I expected it to be. Any advice? This comes from uh, Liam, and Liam, good news is for you, I have once been a 14-year-old boy, and I once was a first year in high school, so I can definitely relate, man, and I could relate to that first year, and I could tell you, whatever you think about me, whatever you think about this podcast or who I am, just remember this. At one time, when I was 14, I felt the same thing as you. I felt out of place. I felt small. I felt like I didn't know as much. I felt very vulnerable. I felt uh, I felt like everyone was looking at me like I was this, this just small, immature, stupid kid. I felt out of place. That's. I think you would feel out of place being 14 years old in anything you did in life, not just your first year of high school. It's tough, and so I want to I want to acknowledge that. Um, that you're not alone. And I bet you there's there's hardly anybody that would listen to this podcast and think back to that and think, huh, that's weird. I didn't, I was great when I was 14, first year in high school, I just crushed it. <laughs> no, not not many people would think that. So you're everything you're feeling is totally natural. Um you say this is mostly because I can't motivate myself to do my work. I've tried getting help, but no one seems to understand what I'm when ha I'm having a hard time with. Well, I understand, and and I think I would wonder if you're asking the wrong people. If you went up to one of your teachers and you were totally honest with them, and you said, "Hey, teacher," and and you just read this email, you said, "I'm having a hard time motivating myself to do the work. I really want to." but I, this is much harder than I expected. The teacher's job, and, and I guarantee you, somebody at this school is a really, really, really good teacher that's going to say, let's help. How, how could we, let's work on this. You know, let's meet at four o'clock today in my office and let's walk through this. Let's see what you're having trouble with. 
what you're, you know, where are you stumbling? What subjects are you good at? What subjects are you not good at? I would then I would lead you also, Liam, um, to some kind of extracurricular activity. Like, I mean, we'll go down the list. I mean, it could for me it was football. I just dove into football. It could be track. Could be basketball. Could be um, choir. Could be band. Could be chest club. Could be acting. You can join the theater. Um, there's there's a lot of options at your school. I know there are. There's there's options at every school. So I would encourage you to get involved with this. And when you do that, say you go into theater. And I didn't do that, but but I know a lot of people that did. And when you get involved with theater, you Im- immediately immerse yourself with people around you that are like-minded, meaning they they liked theater enough to join just like you. And so when you're in theater and then you start talking about this stuff to these other peers that are like-minded with you. And so you go, anybody else having a hard time with this high school thing like me? And somebody's going to go, yeah, I didn't, didn't really want to admit it, but I feel like no one understands. And you go, me too. That's how I feel. I feel like no one else understands. And they go, yeah, me too. I just, and you go, what are you struggling with? I'm struggling with Mrs. Simpson's English class. Me too. That book we're reading, it just makes no sense. And they go, yeah. And so through that, through that communication and that community that you get out of like-minded people, you start finding solutions together in a group. As humans, we are, we are meant to be put in groups and, and think in groups and socialize in groups. That's just what we do. It's very difficult for a human to isolate themselves. And, and if they do, it's very rare that you, you hear of some guy that moved to Alaska by himself. It sounds awesome. It sounds romantic. Move, move to Alaska by yourself, live in the woods, build a cabin with your bare hands, just you and, and your fishing pole. Like that sounds amazing. But as soon as a couple of weeks go by, you realize quickly humans need community, right? So join the community. D- don't just walk the halls and go into different classrooms and sit at different desks and think like that you're all alone and no one understands you. So immediately get involved. This is a really big deal. It could be, it literally could be anything. It could be the photography club, it could be student council, it could be the, the, the uh, I don't know, shop, it could be auto, auto mechanics class. Um, there's, like I said, there's, there's a million options. Um, do that, find that community, and communicate with your teacher. And then the last thing is just keep showing up. Keep showing up every day because something's going to happen. If you keep showing up and you keep showing that commitment to it, then something will change in terms of you're going to meet somebody or something's going to fall in your life. You're going to realize, man, I love, I love, actually love this history class because I love talking about World War II. That's me. I love World War II. So, uh, you, man, I'll, we've been studying World War II. I actually love it. I don't like calculus class, but I love history. And so that's a step up. Like that's a, you got a, a foothold now to keep, to keep this ball rolling, to keep this high school thing going. And then by the time you, you hit the end of the semester, you've got something to stand on, your history class. So communicate, find community, and just show up. Keep showing up, all right? Subject line, this is interesting. Subject line says on this next one, my husband says he's done. We'll see what this says. Granger, I've followed you and your wife for quite some time. I've been inspired by both you and her many times. Amber's strength has been so inspiring to me. Right now, I'm just having a hard time staying strong. My husband told me two weeks before our third son was to be born that he is done. He says he's unhappy and he has been for some time. And he's just never brought it up. I take my vows very seriously. And even though he has cheated on me, I'm still committed to our marriage. How do I keep my faith and strength with everything going on? Thank you, Tabitha. Tabitha, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, can't, I cannot imagine uh, what, what you're going through. And, and the strength that it, that it took you to even write this email. 
and for me to say it out loud like this on a podcast. I want to thank you for your vulnerability and your your willingness to not hide in a closet and disappear. Some people get news like this and they just they they think that they're the flawed one and they're the ones that have the problems and their husband was probably right to cheat on them and he was probably right to fall out of love with them because there's something wrong with them. And that's the wrong way to go. That's that's the wrong way to go. You're you're your husband is is dealing with some major demons. And I was going to ask you before I hit this sentence that says he, uh, he has cheated on me. I was going to ask you that sounds like that might be going on. When he says he's unhappy and he has been for quite some time, that usually doesn't happen in that way unless he's also seeing somebody else that makes that's making up for something that he feels lacking in his life and there's some somebody new is filling some void in him because he's he's not whole in in himself regardless of you and so he's seeking it from other places so it, that, that means it has nothing to do with you he's he has problems with his confidence or who he is or maybe he's getting a little bit older and he's looking in the mirror and going man i just I think I've missed my prime. I'm out of my prime now. I peaked in, when I was 21, and, and now I, I, I need something to help lift me up. And my wife is, you know, we have three kids together, and it's kind of old news now, and I need something new and fresh to replenish me. So it's not about the new girl being better than you. It's something missing in him. Now, I would say on this podcast, it's God missing out of his life. Because if he had, if he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he loved Jesus and he was pursuing him passionately, this wouldn't, this wouldn't happen. It just doesn't. It doesn't happen that way. But that's not your question. Your question is, how do I keep my faith and strength with everything going on? Well, I think immediately, because you brought up faith, immediately you seek the church and you seek, you seek wise counsel in the church. And so there's three steps for you. And it's probably in this order. One, pray. You take it all to God. You bring everything to him. You lay it at his feet. And you tell him something like this, God, I, I can't. This, this, what's going on with me right now is, is terrifying. It's humiliating. And, and I feel so lost and so vulnerable. I can't do it at all. I can't, can't accomplish happiness on my own. I need you, God. I need you. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your strength. Increase my faith. Show me that you're a sovereign God, that you're in control, that you have a plan for me and my life and my kids because it feels like the walls are falling down right now. Give that to him. Give that to God. It's like it's like when I see my son and he's, he's doing a chore that I've given him, right? And I'm watching him from the window. And I see him struggling with the chore. And I know that he's, he can't do it on his own, but he's going to try as hard as he can. And I see that he's failing over and over and over. I know what's going on. I know how, it could, how the problem can be solved, how he can get through this. But I'm not going to help him until he finally comes over to me and he goes, Daddy, I can't do this. Can you help me? And then I go, yes, let me help you. You're ready. You're ready now. You've given it back to me. I've, you've shown me that you're, that you're dedicated to this and you can't do it and you, you bring it back to me. And I go, yeah, buddy, let me help you. Let me show you how to get through this. So that's what God is doing to you. He's watching you and he's seeing the pain and he's, he sympathizes with that pain. Our God sympathizes with every level of suffering that we have. We have a God. We have, we have a God that, that died on the cross As a man, 100% man, 100% God, he died feeling every bit of emotional and physical and spiritual pain that a human could feel. So he sees you and he acknowledges that and he waits for you to turn to him and go, it's you, it's, it's yours. That's step one. Step two, you read your Bible. You get up every day and you go, God, I'm giving it to you. That's, that's our communication. Prayer is me talking to you, but your Bible Your word is you talking to me. So I'm going to soak in this word. I'm going to read it every morning. His mercies are new every morning. So I'm going to get up when when the mercies are new and fresh. 
and I'm going I'm to recharge myself. I'm going to get into your word and I'm going to see what you have to say to me. And you're going to find out that that book is different than any other book. Any other book, you read it and you start to get to know the book as you read it. That's any other book. But the Bible's different. The Bible, you start to read it and you realize at some point the book is getting to know me. This book knows me before I know it. Your third step is seek wise counsel. And I believe you could find that at your church, a good church, a good solid church. If you don't have a good church in your town, email takeandreadpodcast at gmail.com. That's my buddy, my close friend, Pastor Chad, who's on this podcast a lot. He helps people find churches. So if anyone's listening and they're like, I'm in a town and I don't know, there's too many options or there's not enough options and I don't know where to go on Sundays. I don't know what ch- church to join. Email that, email Chad take and read podcast at gmail.com and ask him, but, but go find a church in your town and bring it to, bring it to the elders. Join a small group. You're going to find other women that have been through the same thing, other men that have gone through the same thing from the other side, the other perspective. And you're going to seek wise counsel and you go, what do I do? And they're going to go, we're going to walk through this with you. So you take it to God in prayer. You read your Bible and you seek wise counsel and you will make it through this, Tabitha. It's not going to go away. It's not going to get erased or disappeared. There's no power of God to just zap you like a genie and go, I'm going to erase this problem. Boom. There's no power in that. The power is when God goes, I'm going to get you through this fire together. And I'll bring you out the other side, holding your hand, carrying you through it. There's a power in that. And then one day, might be five years, might be 10, might be 15 years down the road, you're going to look back and you're going to go, there was a turning point in my life and everything changed for the better. And I'm so glad of, I'm so glad for my story and who I am and the history and this, the cheating husband I had and what I learned from that. I'm so glad I went through it because now I'm stronger. I'm more refined by fire. It took fire to refine the gold, but it made me so much better through the fire, through the heat the compression of, of this suffering that you're going through will make you better. And it sounds so hard to hear that from your perspective. It sounds so hard to, because you seem, you seem like you're just right in the middle of the fire. How am I ever going to get out of this? How am I going to look back and go, I was refined by this, this pain? But you will. You will. And nothing that I've said so far, nothing so far means, from what I've heard from you, that you're going to absolutely give up on this marriage. I'm not saying that because, because God can heal him too. He can heal him. He could turn this around. He could bring him back to you. He could heal this marriage. He can. So I'm not, I'm not discounting that that could happen, but I'm telling you your task right now for you and these three kids. And I'm so sorry, Tabitha. Where do we go next, right? Here's a, here's a lighter hearted one. It says, podcast question. Hello, Granger. My name is Brendan. I'm from Indiana. I came to your recent concert in Valparaiso, Indiana. Amazing show. And I was wondering if Earl Dibbles Jr. ever dropped the guitar when it was thrown to him from the side of the stage. I've been wondering this for a long time. Thanks for the amazing music. It has brought me through so many hard times. Thanks for responding. Yee yee. What's up, Brendan? Shout out to Indiana. Uh, Earl, there's a moment at the end of our show when Chris, my tour manager, throws Earl's guitar to him. And depending on the show, it could be a far throw or it could be a short throw. But we've done it for 11 years now. We've done this, this antic, as we call it. And I can remember two times when the guitar was dropped. And the rule is if the guitar is ever dropped, I have to smash it on the stage. Like that's the rule. I have to destroy it <laughs> right then and there. And it's so probably not many of you listening have seen this happen, but one time was in Corpus Christi, Texas at Concrete Amphitheater, Concrete Street. I, uh, it, there was a big wind and Blake threw it. And it was when Blake was throwing the guitar, he threw it and the wind caught it and it just sailed into Randy Rogers drum set. <laughs> so that was bad. That was a bad day. Um, and I destroyed it. I just 
took it and took the guitar and destroyed it. Um, these are replicas, by the way. There's not, there's not, I don't use the original. The original is in this podcast room with me. The second time it happened, we were on the Florida Georgia Line Tour and we were in Canada in, in an arena and Frank Maglin, another sound guy, was throwing it and, and he missed it as it was going back to him. So I caught it, played it, threw it back to him and he dropped it as it was going back to him. And so... Th- Although it wasn't it wasn't that big a deal to the crowd, um, all the other bands that were there that night j- just gave us grief for for years. They still do. They called um, called him Frank Butter Butterhands, <laughs> Frank Butterhands. <laughs> but Chris Lee, my tour manager, uh, took over throwing. We have not missed one since. So, good question, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Next question, subject line, interesting again. It says, I wasn't religious enough. Hey, Granger, my name's Kyle. I'm from Sarasota Springs, New York. I'm a sophomore in college, and the year started out great. I met literally the perfect person for me. It was such an amazing change from the past relationship I was in. But after a couple months, she acted so weird. And we went on a drive, and she ended our relationship because I wasn't religious enough for her. I told her, that I want her to be happy, and if that means us breaking up, then I'm okay with that, even though I wasn't because I miss talking to her. I'm somewhat religious, but not crazy about it. But I never thought about that relationship, that our relationship would end over it. And it hurts because I know it's my fault. I've tried talking to some new girls, but it just seems like everyone only wants to hook up, and I've never been into that. My question is, what should I do? I know God has a plan set for everyone, and everyone will work it out in the end. But I've lost the motivation because after my relationship ended, it seems that everything just got worse. If you have any advice, please let me know. It comes from Kyle in New York. What's up, Kyle? Shout out to New York. Um, tough, tough situation you're in, but but common. I would I would tell you a couple things. If a girl tells you she wants to break up because you're not religious enough. I think that sounds like uh, an excuse. It sounds like it's not me, it's you, you know, or it's not you, it's me, however you want to look at it. It sounds like you're a common breakup line. And, and that's, that is a common one. Like, sorry, this is a God thing. Like God, God has a different plan for me. And there's truth to that. And I'm sure there's truth to what she's saying, but the the fact is it just wouldn't have gone down that way if she truly loved you in a in a life partner type way then it just wouldn't have gone down like that she would have said hey kyle we need to talk and she sits you down and she just goes i love you i i can see myself spending the rest of my life with you but there's something that's been bothering me that i want to i want to walk through with you i'm i'm becoming closer to god and I feel like you're not, and I want to start taking you to church with me, right? Like that's that's just the way it would go down if she truly loved you, but she, but she doesn't. And I know I know that's tough, but that's that's the campfire talk we're having. You know, this is a safe spot around the campfire, and I'm looking at it from the outside, looking in, and I'm just telling you, she would have tried harder to make it work. She would have this would have drug out for a year of her taking you to church and working and praying. Can we pray together, Kyle? You know, like, can we pray? Because, but it's just not that. It's not that. She's using that as an excuse. Maybe she likes another guy. Maybe she has her eyes on somebody else already. That's, that could be. Maybe she just doesn't love you anymore or never really did. I know these are hard words to hear, but I'm, tr- I'm trying to be honest. It would This podcast would suck if I just sugarcoated everything and said, no, man, she probably loves you. I don't think she does, Kyle. Um, and so I would, I would let her go. I would let her go. But I would, I personally, me, I would want to dig in with you around this campfire and talk about this religious thing, right? Um, it's, it's important to know that you, you're, who you're listening to. I am a Christian follower of Christ, and I don't believe in orthodox religion. I don't believe in structured legalist religion at all. I don't believe in 
you got to you got to pray three times a day and you got to face west and you got to put your mat down and you got to you have to go to church and you have to get baptized and you have to I don't believe in have tos. I believe in a personal relationship with our savior Jesus. And through that, through the faith in that, through the trust, the the complete surrender to that, the fruits of it, the outcrop, the the what happens after that is you want to be better. You want to you want to start aligning your life with Christ. You want to start being more like he taught us to be. You want to not in a religious orderly perfect I got to be perfect to get to God way. That's not it. It never is. In fact, when Jesus was on earth, he he totally disrupted the Pharisees and anyone that thought like that. Anyone that thought you can get to heaven by being perfect, and you have to do this and this and line it all up, and if you do it enough, then he, again, the God's like Santa Claus, and he has a naughty list and a good list. And the more checks you get on the good list, the closer you're going to get to heaven. Jesus just disrupted that mentality. And as humans, we constantly fall back into thinking that that's what we need to do. This is off topic, but it's relevant to, to the, the, the idea that she says you're not religious, and you say... Your quote is, I am somewhat religious, but not crazy about it. But then two lines later, you say, I know God has a plan set for everyone. Those two things, you got to admit, they don't really line up because although I'm trying to be anti-religion with you, I'm trying to sit with you and be anti-religious, at the same time, if you truly trust that God has a plan and that he's sovereign meaning all-knowing, all-powerful, all-creating, if you truly believe that with faith, then I don't think you would say, I'm somewhat religious. So do you see the difference in, in what I'm trying to say? That, that, that all the, although Jesus came in as anti-establishment, anti-religious groups, there is, a, there is still an outcropping, a fruit of what you would see from you in your life and I think you would quickly say, I'm, I might not be religious, but I love Jesus, and I'm pursuing him passionately. I'm seeking a personal relationship with him. I think, I think you would have included something like that if that's what you truly felt. And so I would encourage, I would encourage you there that as you're, as you're kind of navigating the new chapter of your life without her, and you're trying to figure out if you want to fight for her and bring her back, or if you're going to find somebody new, or if you're going to go solo for a little bit during that, that this, all these decisions you're just rolling around with, then you start wrestling with this idea that maybe, maybe I don't have the relationship with God that I thought I had. And maybe there's, there's some kind of truth to what she told me. I'm not going to take what she said is, is, is absolute mandates for me to to start being more structurally religious but i'm going to wonder if maybe there's something in my life that that uh it's not kind of li- it's not lining up with what jesus wants from me and it doesn't start from me doing those things it's the opposite it starts from me pursuing jesus and like i said earlier in this podcast it starts with you just going just just like uh just like the girl that that lost her cousin going to Jesus and going, I can't do this anymore. I've tried, I've tried and, and, and things keep falling apart around me and I feel depression and I feel lost and I feel broken and I don't want to do it and I can't do it. So God, I'm giving it back to you. You just take it from me, take it from me. Let me pursue you. Use me. Use me as a vessel, like just tear me apart and use me for your purpose, not mine. I don't want to do mine anymore. It keeps failing. It only ends up in depression. I might have little victories here and there, but it, it leaves me feeling empty in the end. That's what I would, that, that's the conversation I would have tonight. Kyle, I appreciate you, buddy. I know you, I gave you way more than, than what you're really asking, but um, that's, that's, that's my thoughts. And that's what you get from this podcast. My thoughts. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for joining me. We got a new year coming up and a whole new year of podcast. Thanks for being with me every Monday morning. I love you guys. We'll see you soon. Yee yee. 
Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel, hit that little like button and notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. If you have a question for me that you would like me to answer, email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. Yee yee.